Good morning, everyone. My name is Allison Gaudermeyer. I'm the Multimedia PR Specialist here at Sarasota Memorial Healthcare System. I appreciate all of you guys who have taken the time to join us today. SMH's Brian D. Jellison Cancer Institute is a Commission on Cancer COC accredited program. COC accreditation assures our community that SMH is committed to providing the highest quality of cancer care across the full continuum. Cancer screening and cancer prevention education are among the many components of the COC accreditation. This program today is designed to enhance community health through lung cancer prevention, education, and screening. A few housekeeping items here before we get started. You're gonna notice that all of the participants today are on mute. We ask you to remain on mute and submit your questions using the Q&A function in the bottom corner. We also appreciate those of you who have submitted your questions in advance. If you click on that, you can type a question and if time is permitting, we'll go ahead and get to all of them as we can today. Now I wanna introduce you to our wonderful panelists here to answer your questions. Dr. Nicholas Sacalarios, a primary care provider who recently relocated to Sarasota, Florida from Long Island, New York. He is a practicing internal medicine physician who cares for and helps patients quit smoking every day. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Sacalarios. Thank you. We also have Dr. Heider Okonobo, he is, who specialized in thoracic radiology and has been practicing in Sarasota for many years now. He believes technology and science have a very strong role in early detection of diseases such as lung cancer. Thank you so much for joining us as well, Dr. Okonobo. Thanks for having me. Finally, we have Dr. Joseph Seaman. He is the medical director of the Lung Cancer Screening and Incidental Pulmonary Program, as well as the Lung Health Clinic at Sarasota Memorial. Dr. Seaman is passionate about lung cancer prevention, lung cancer screening, early diagnosis, and symptom management for patients who have lung cancer. Dr. Seaman, thank you. Thank you. So Dr. Sacalarios, I wanna start with you. We have a few questions for you. First, can you talk about how as a primary care provider, what is your role in getting your patients to quit smoking? Uh, first of all, just always asking the patient on pretty much every visit if they are smoking or screening for it. Uh, that's the number one thing. Uh, second, I would say is always trying to gauge patients um, interest in, in their motivation uh, to quit. You know, because a, a provider can tell a patient, you need to quit, you need to quit, but really you want to start with the patient, um, gauge how, how motivated they are. And I usually, I usually use a scale, zero to 10, 10 being absolutely, they're going to do it, zero, they're not going to do it. And uh, most people fall somewhere between a four and a seven. Studies show that if you say seven or above, you have a very good chance of quitting. Um, and uh, and then at that point, we'll talk about a quit date and different strategies to, to quit. And important to, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to ask, is there anything you can say to get patients to that seven or above? Is there anything you can say to get them on board with quitting smoking? Yeah, because uh, when I ask them that question, nobody ever says zero. Even, even the least motivated people will say three, four. Um, so I just say, I want you to think about, uh, you know, why you didn't say zero. Um, and they always have their reasons. They don't need to hear about uh, you know, the cost is, I, I do bring up financial. It's, you're going to save a lot of money. Everybody knows the health benefits. Um, uh, so I just, and then I always try to bring them back about a month later, even if they say no, just say, let's, let's do a televisit, um, you know, just to kind of see where you are and try to get them on board. What therapies do you commonly recommend to help people to quit? Cause there's so many options out there. Yeah, the three approved ones are um, nicotine replacement therapy, which includes a patch, the gum, lozenges, um, Zyban or bupropion, which is an antidepressant, anti-anxiety medication, and Chantix, which actually has the best results of, of all three of those. Um, so those, those are the three that, were, you know, that are FDA approved for, for, for cessation. Now, do patients ever ask you if an e-cig or vaping is a good way to quit using traditional cigarettes? And what do you say to them if they do? Um, I say again, it's 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 not FDA approved. If you want to, I usually say, tell them that if you know if you want to try it short term as a bridge to cessation, that's okay. Um, but there are, as we know, uh, there are issues with the jewels, uh, you know, with lung damage. I'm sure Dr. Seaman could talk about it. But uh, so we we don't encourage it long term. But as a bridge, I sometimes say that that's okay. All right, thank you so much. We'll we'll have a few more questions for you in a little bit, uh, Dr. Okonobo. 
Why are annual lung cancer screenings so widely recommended? Well, in, because of a very large study um, performed recently, um, we a lot of um, patients enrolled. We compared um, the detection of lung cancer uh, over the years. And this study was uh, very well designed. Um, uh, and we found out that we could detect lung cancer very early using the appropriate uh, method, uh, the appropriate technology. Uh, and the key for, for this, why this is important, is because the early you detect, the higher the chances of the person being cured. So my insurance, um, let's say, will not cover screenings until I'm 55. Why is that? Um, what we found out is that um, the great majority of patients that develop lung cancer are on the age around 70 years old. Um, so it doesn't mean you don't you have zero chances of being a young person and develop lung cancer, but we are talking about screening the population with a, uh, with a test. Um, so we have to find out what are the age range for um, being effective for screening people that are actually in a high risk percentage. Um, and that range goes from 55 to 75, 80. Um, so if you are younger than that, um, there's a high, uh, the insurance will be likely not covered. And the reason is um, there is a very low chance of this person develop lung cancer in comparison with the population. Okay. so. Um... Why would a patient get a CT scan instead of a chest X-ray, and what is the difference between the two of them? Uh, that's a very good question. So the study that was developed was exactly to answer this question. Is chest X-ray effective in detecting lung cancer? And we use a comparison with the CAT scan, which was the, um, the study, which is considered gold standard. This, this term gold standard, what does that mean? It means that is a test that is very good in doing something. Um, and over the years, what they found out, um, actually about seven years, is that, um, so you have two groups of people, one being screened with chest X-rays, the other with CAT scans. We found that the group screening by CAT scan had a mortality by lung cancer 20% less. And that is a substantial information to us to tell us CAT scans are a way better than X-rays for detection of lung cancer. Why is it called a low dose CT scan? It's a low dose CAT scan. Well, the main reason is because it's a less dose than a regular CAT scan. Um, so I was trying, what, what I, when I get, ask this question, what I try to do is explain how, how we grade radiation. Uh, radiation is everywhere, uh, even in your house. There's something called background radiation. The way we measure it is um, with a, a, a uh, millisieverts, which is, is, is a method to detect how much radiation you have received. Um, this um, depends on many factors. Um, for instance, um, in the day by day, if you live at the sea level, because the atmosphere of the earth protects us from receiving this radiation, you're going to get yearly in the United States about three millisieverts of radiation. So just by living, you're going to get three millisieverts. But let's say you live in Colorado or you live in New Mexico, which are high altitude, you're going to get more radiation, about five millisieverts. So the low dose CAT scan has this name because you receive a very small dose in comparison to a normal CAT scan. Well, how much less? The regular CT chest gives you seven millisieverts of radiation dose. The low dose gives 1.5. So we're talking seven versus 1.5. That's why we call low dose CAT scan. So what does it mean to have a false positive CAT scan and why would this happen? Oh, very good. So when we screen, uh, when we look at the lungs, 
we are trying to find pulmonary nodules. Um, pulmonary nodules are caused by many things. It can be caused by a prior infection. It can be from perhaps a prior injury that you had in the lungs, and the lungs heal and form a scar, which looks like a little nodule. Just like when you cut your skin, you can get a scar on your skin. The same happened with the lung. If the lung is injured, you form a nodule. That nodule, it's not related to cancer. So when we see a pulmonary nodule and we look at it, we say, okay, we have a nodule. Is it cancer or not? Um, a false positive is when you say it is cancer when actually is, it isn't. So how to avoid a false positive? You have to have a parameter. You have a baseline study that shows the nodule. If a year later you repeat the study and that nodule is the same size, it's very unlikely that that is related to cancer. So false positives have um, a role on screening programs, uh, on, on breast uh, screening programs, on lung screening programs. Uh, but we have a method to minimize the amount of false positives. And the whole relationship is related to pulmonary nodules. And we actually received a question while we're on this topic. Um, are false negatives common or for false positives for that matter? False negatives can happen. And this is one of the reasons uh, why we have to be very diligent on repeating the images yearly, uh, which kind of uh, brings to another question. Why do I have to do this every year? Well, let's say we found one of those pulmonary nodules, okay? And we measured the nodule, and the nodule has a reasonable size, let's say about seven millimeters according to our scores. Um, the nodule has a very low probability of being cancer, but it could be. How we will know? Likely this person with a seven millimeter nodule will have a repeat CAT scan in six months, according to the guidelines. And knowing that the nodule increase make us getting even more suspicious about it. And that's when we're gonna scale the whole you know, uh, pathway of trying to find out what is this nodule. It is cells that are malignant or it's not. Great, thank you, Dr. Okanobo. I'm sure we'll, sure we'll have a few questions for you here in just a little bit, but Dr. Seaman, we have a number of questions for you. Okay. First of all, why is lung cancer so prevalent and often so deadly? Yeah, so a couple of reasons why uh, lung cancer is prevalent in our society is uh, largely because of the risk factors that uh, are present in our society. And the most common uh, lung cancer associated risk factor is smoking. Uh, for decades, smoking was very common. Uh, millions of the people uh, smoked cigarettes. And as a result, that's, that's one of the, the biggest modifiable risk factors for smoking. And that's why we see it being so significant. Uh, unfortunately, uh, like many cancers, lung cancer will present at a late stage. Um, recently, it, you know, the American College of Cancer will come out with different statistics. And right now about three quarters of all lung cancers present with stage three or stage four disease. And those are late stages for lung cancer. Uh, and once the cancer started to spread around the lung and around the body, the chance for a cure uh, goes way down. So an individual with advanced stage lung cancer, despite that may only be with us for a year or two before they succumb to the disease. Conversely, if, that if an individual is diagnosed with early stage lung cancer, there's a chance for a cure of the disease. Um, that individual could have surgery to remove that portion of the lung that contains the cancer, and by effectively removing the cancer, they've been cured by the surgery. Uh, if they cannot have surgery, then there's other treatments that could be delivered, such as stereotactic radiosurgery, where it focuses radiation to the cancer and kills the cancer cells thereby affecting a cure for the cancer. So the focus that, that we like to take is to find the cancer as early as possible so that we can offer that individual a cure for their, their cancer. 
Uh, and that's what we talk about doing a stage shift. So, so all of these high-risk patients with for lung cancer, we can engage them early on and get a lung cancer screening study. We can identify the cancer at an early stage and shift the uh, cancer stage and thereby offer them a cure or improve their outcomes. And uh, that's the whole purpose of this is about the patients uh, in our community so we can improve their outcomes. Are there any other groups who are considered high risk aside from smokers? Yeah, so the most common things that uh, we're able to look at is age, which we mentioned before. And the reason why age is a important risk factor is because you've lived long enough to accumulate enough exposures to put you at a higher risk. Um, particularly, you've smoked for enough years to generate that, that higher risk. Or you've worked in an occupation where you've been exposed to certain chemicals that put you at a higher risk. Um, and that's where we have to kind of focus on the risk factors uh, related to smoking. Uh, smoking and age are the, the two biggest risk factors, and that's what uh, most insurance companies and Medicare use as sort of screening criteria uh, to determine if someone's eligible. Uh, other risk factors that we take into account, uh, but it's harder to uh, assign a risk for to that are things like secondhand smoke, uh, so the spouse of a long-term smoker, um, that's well recognized as a risk factor, but it's hard to put that in a mathematical model. Other things include air pollution or certain occupations where individuals are exposed to um, smoke or chemicals that increase their risk. And uh, another one that we don't commonly think of here in Southwest Florida is uh, radon. Radon is a naturally occurring um, radiation breakdown product that's present in the soil and certain rocks uh, and definitely has a role in different parts of our, our country uh, where patients may come from that is in fact a risk factor for lung cancer. So how would someone know if they really should be getting screened for lung cancer? Yeah, and that's where you know we really want to get the message out that um, you should as an individual when you think about your health, look at all of the different reasons uh, for cancer screening in general, uh, regardless whether it's breast cancer, colon cancer, or lung cancer, um, you need to start thinking about that as you age to try to maximize your health and your um, longevity. Um, we focus on lung cancer because that's sort of the area of medicine that, that we're focused on, and we want these individuals to have the best possible outcomes in our community. Um, why do you think so few people are getting screened? Yeah, that's a better question. You know, we know in our community that only three to five percent of the, our community is getting lung cancer screening, despite, despite the fact that they're eligible. Uh, I think there's there's lots of different reasons for that. One, um, patients are fearful. They don't want to get screened because if they don't get screened, then they don't know that they may have a cancer. Uh, the second thing is, is they're fearful about the cost that may be associated with it. Um, and this is a covered benefit. All cancer-related screenings are covered benefits for Medicare recipients. Uh, and almost all insurance carriers also follow suit and provide cancer screening um, uh, tests as a covered benefit. So, uh, you know, whether it's they're concerned about getting the diagnosis of cancer, whether they're concerned about the cost, those are two big ones. Um, and then there's a lot of folks that just don't know about it. They're, they're uneducated about cancer screenings. Uh, they don't know that they're eligible for it. They don't know that they're at risk for it. Um, and uh, they just choose not to, to seek that out. So what can be done to decrease the number of people dying from lung cancer? Yeah, the, the biggest thing is, is advocating, not just advocating for yourself, but advocating for your spouse, your loved one, your mom, your dad, your, your aunt, uncles, your friends. Um, to, to play a positive role in their life. Um, and what we want to do is get the message out that there are things that we can do um, to help patients recognize uh, their risk factors for lung cancer and then screen the appropriate patients so that we know um, who is at high risk, who may have lung cancer, uh, so we can aggressively manage their nodules and their cancer. Um, but that all starts with the patient and the patient's um, community around them to, to help them, encourage them to go get screened for lung cancer. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Seaman. Um, I want to get to some of the questions we've started to receive in the Q and A. So uh, I think this question might be for you, Dr. Seaman. Do your lungs get affected if you have had various surgeries under under anesthesia, and could that possibly affect your screening or your reading of the screening? So, uh, based on my knowledge. Uh, Surgery itself is not a risk factor for lung cancer. Um, what I would say, though, if you are having surgery, particularly on your chest, like if you had heart surgery um, or surgery on your lungs, you may be left with some scars on the lungs. And as Dr. Uh, Okonobo mentioned, uh, anytime somebody has some scarring on the lungs uh, and has a lung cancer screening, uh, sometimes that scar can look like a nodule or it can masquerade as a possible nodule. And that's what we talk about a possible false positive. And that's where you need to have a prior study and you need to have a, a physician or a healthcare provider take a really detailed history about exactly what you had, when you had it, and then coordinate that with the radiologist because sometimes the radiologist doesn't have a, all that history. So that's when you have to talk to the radiologist, coordinate the care with them and say, this is the situation with the patient. What do you think now looking at the scan? And that really helps provide a much uh, better informed discussion about the patient's care and uh, better result. Uh, but going back to the primary premise, surgery in and of itself is not a risk factor for lung cancer that I'm aware of. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seaman. I'm not sure if this is a question for Dr. Sakularis or Dr. Okonobo, but um, the person writes, what if I am over 30 pack years? Is this still right for me? So I don't know who wants to take that question. You take a stab at that one. Hmm? Sakalaris, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, yeah, the guidelines are you have to have quit, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but 15 years prior or a current smoker and a total pack year history of, uh, uh, is it, I think it's 15 pack years, correct? It's 30 pack years, quit within the last 15 years. So. Yeah, 30 pack years, okay. Yeah, and, and the, the issue is, is um, the more you smoke, uh, we, we like to think a higher risk factor, although um, we, we know that statistically when they do all of the studies and they take all of this detailed information from patients, they see a clear correlation with the more you smoke, the higher your risk of cancer is. Uh, but if you only smoked a little bit, only a few packs while you were in college, for instance, that doesn't rise to the threshold to flip the risk trigger to a high risk category. Uh, but certainly anything past 30 pack years, which is one pack a day for 30 years or a half a pack a day for 60 years or three packs a day for 10 years. That's how that calculation is derived. Um, but uh, we definitely know that if you smoke for a total of 30 pack years, you are at high risk. Uh, if you smoke for more than that, you're probably at higher risk, but um, I, I don't think the multiplier in the statistical equation changes much. Okay, great. Dr. Okonobo, this is a question for you. What can you expect from a lung cancer screening? Can you describe what a patient's experience is like during that screening? Sure. Um, so what happens is you walk into the radiology department um, and you're gonna be, um, you're gonna register for, for the study. Uh, they're gonna let us know that you are there. Uh, then one of our um, CT technologists um, are going to come um, uh, present uh, themselves to you and going to walk you until the CAT scan um, suite. The CAT scan suite is, a, is where the CAT scan machine is. And if you have never seen one of those, it, it looks like a, 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 a tube in the shape of a donut with a table. Um, so they're going to... Uh, ask you to, you know, verify if you don't have any, uh, you know, uh, metals on the pockets of your of your clothes, or if there's no metals or or chains on your neck, because that can uh, interfere with the image. They're gonna ask you to uh, take the remove, take those off, um, and then you're gonna lay down 
on the table. Um, and the first um, pass in the, into the CAT scan is the planning. It's very fast, maybe probably about three seconds. Um, we're going to get a something we call the scout image, which looks like an X-ray. Is the picture of your chest? With that picture, the CT technology is going to make the planning of where should start, where should end, uh, in the computer. Once the plan is done, the table is going to go inside of the gantry, the, the uh, donut shape tube, and you're going to hear a voice saying, "Take a deep breath in." and hold. At the moment, you take a breath in and going to hold and you're going to hear the noise like which is the machine scanning the entire chest. That takes about 15 to 20 seconds. Uh, and it's over. The CAT scan is a study uh, below the, the cancer screening study is done without conscious. So you do not, you will not need an intravenous access. You do not need uh, iodine contrast, uh, so no concerns regarding allergies and other things that sometimes you see with other types of studies. And then once you're done, and that's it, um, you're just going to stand up and walk and wait for um, the results. So really what you're saying is it's very quick and painless and an easy screening. Excellent. Great. Dr. Seaman, I believe this question is for you. For a long-term smoker who may be asymptomatic, what are the most common symptoms that will first manifest themselves if they do have lung cancer? Oops. That's okay. Um, yeah, we, A, you know, lung cancer screening wants to focus on the asymptomatic patients because they don't know they have lung cancer and we want to find it before it manifests symptoms because once it starts to manifest symptoms, that often suggests that there's a um, organ that's starting to be involved by either metastasis or the, the cancer inside the lung has grown to the point where it's starting to push on bronchial tubes or push on blood vessels so that they start having symptoms. And that usually means that the lung cancer may be more complicated at that point. Uh, common uh, complaints uh, that patients have um, that have lung cancer is uh, they, they typically are somewhat vague, uh, but they can be weakness, fatigue, chest heaviness, chest pressure, cough, uh, shortness of breath with exertion, um, and sometimes weight loss goes along with this. Usually in late stages, do they start to cough up blood or have a lot of uh, mucus production? But those are the, the common um, complaints that, that usually bring patients to chest imaging um, that uh, then identifies an abnormality and that we start to work up and ultimately find to have lung cancer. Great. Dr. Sacalarios, uh, this is a question for you, I believe. Um, when should someone start talking to their primary care provider about possibly getting screening or when they need screening? The, you know, total pack years and Sacalarius, you got cut off there. So if oh, you could start over. I was going to say that's, that should be part of the primary doctor really screening uh, to see, you know, the patient's history, smoking history. Um, but they can start, uh, it's rec, you know, the insurance covers it at 55. Um, so that's, that's the age. If they're an ex-smoker, if they've quit within the last 15 years and have a total of 30 pack years. Um, but so just keep that in mind, 55 maybe um and sometimes if people want to get it sooner they can pay out of pocket uh if the insurance is not covering it and there are places that it's affordable um to get it done earlier if, if they feel like they want to do that great and dr seaman i i think you kind of answered this but another question should someone get the screening only if they feel badly or, or maybe have a cough so uh no they they should get the well, anytime somebody who meets the criteria for lung cancer screening, we should engage that individual and determine whether or not they need to have a low dose cancer screening study, or if they're starting to manifest symptoms, we need to evaluate those symptoms and determine the most appropriate study. As Dr. Okonovo mentioned a moment ago, the lung cancer screening is 
done without contrast and it's done uh, with low settings. Um, so from a pulmonary perspective, that study is intended for lung cancer screening. But if somebody's starting to have symptoms, they may need a slightly different test. And that's where we have to kind of sort through their complaints and maybe their physical exam to order the most appropriate study. But it would probably be chest imaging of some sort. And Dr. Seaman, can you talk about the importance of early detection in better outcomes? Yeah, so uh, the earlier that a lung cancer is identified, uh, we believe and we, we know from most studies, the earlier the stage of the lung cancer. So specifically, if we're able to identify a small lung nodule that is shown to be lung cancer through a biopsy, that cancer, if it's stage one, can be surgically removed from the patient or treated with radiation, and as a result, have an excellent uh, result, meaning their life may not, their life expectancy may not be adversely affected by lung cancer. They may live several more years, maybe several decades, depending on their age, without a cancer-related problem. Um, and that's what the whole goal is to find these small cancers in an early stage. So we get this stage shift phenomenon, meaning we go from a high stage of presentation to a low stage of presentation so that the patient gets the best possible outcome. Um, Dr. Sacklarios, um, how do you respond when patients are really resistant to the idea of quitting smoking? Um, like I said, it's, uh, you know, you always have to close the, the deal. In other words, I always just say to the patient, you've got to ask them, say, listen, I, I really want you to quit smoking. I think it's the best thing that's going to happen for your health and everyone you love's health, because it does also affect uh, exposure to the family members. Um, so I, I, I do try to close with that message and also try to bring them, like I said, back to the office or set up some kind of follow up visit to readdress the, uh, uh, the issue. And again, you're not going to drag somebody to a CT to get screened or to quit smoking. Um, you suggest these things. People are free to make their own decisions, but you can encourage them um, and, and keep addressing it on every visit. Great point. Dr. Okanobu. What happens if someone gets screening and something is found? What's what's the next step? So the next step is uh, we found something in the images and we will classify the finding. Um, there is a very structured way to give a grade to this finding. And that's called lung reds. Is a category uh, that came from the early study that I was uh, mentioning to you, uh, which we're going to give a grade from one to four. One looks normal. We didn't see anything that is suspicious. Four is something suspicious. If there is something suspicious, the next step is to consider what to do. You could either decide to do a follow up short follow-up let's say is not very suspicious but we cannot just let it stay a year from now we're going to get a follow-up in six months or if it is something extremely suspicious depending on how the morphology of the nodule is and the size you might need a biopsy or a pet ct to evaluate that later so what happened is depending on the category that the findings of the study, um, the category that the findings of the study is, is going to be a very well structured next step. Uh, and that is um, the way it, it happens. Dr. Sacklaris, another question for you. We want to believe that every patient is truly honest with their physician. And we, of course, heavily encourage that. But let's say, a patient hasn't been as honest about their smoking history and comes to that realization, I want to quit, I need to admit to my doctor that I've been smoking maybe more or longer than I've admitted. Um, how can they approach that topic with their doctor? Um, you mean if the doctor asks them if they smoke and they say no, or you're saying from the patient perspective? 
from the patient perspective, if they haven't yeah. necessarily admitted to their doctor how much or how often they smoke, how do they then approach the topic with their doctor of, look, I, I, I think it's time for me to quit and be a little more honest about where I've been. I mean, listen, come clean and uh, we're here to help. We're not, uh, we're, we're, this isn't, you know, we're not giving bad grades or uh, this is, we're, we're here, we're a team and we're trying to help each other, you know, help you. And uh, so just, just say, look, I have been smoking. I want to do what's right. I want to quit. Um, and there's many options. So uh, we're happy to, you know, discuss it further, but I think it has to come from the patient just saying, having a good relationship with their doctor and, and um, just being able to open up. A good point, Dr. Seaman. When someone um, finds something on their scan or, or comes to you after having they're having a physician find something on their scan, um, how do you address it with the patient and help walk them through some of the treatment options to um, get rid of some of the fear? Yeah, so sometimes the first part of the visit is just trying to reduce their anxiety and their stress related to having an abnormal scan. And, and um, the, the whole purpose behind escalating the care to the point where they're seeing a specialist about the abnormality, as Dr. Openable mentioned, we approach this in a very structured way. So if somebody has a nodule that needs further evaluation, we have to start with who that individual is. What do they bring to the visit? What's their age? What's their risk factors? What's their smoke? What do they do? Uh, as far as their occupation, what kind of hobbies do they have? Uh, and what all of that information does is it helps me start to paint a picture about what could be the cause of the abnormalities on the CAT scan. Is this a chronic infection? Is this scarring from an old uh, lung injury? Is this uh, a pneumonia-like illness that we need to treat with antibiotics? Or could it be a cancer? And then we have to talk as a, a team, you and the patient, me and the patient, to come up with a plan uh, because sometimes my plan and the patient's plan don't match. Uh, patients come in sometimes just wanting to go straight to a biopsy and cut out the abnormality. And I'm trying to pull them back saying, you know, this is small. This is probably an infection. This is something else. Let's, let's focus on maybe some antibiotics and getting a repeat scan in, in three months. Um, we're also starting to get into an era of molecular medicine where now there's some blood tests that will also help stratify the risk of certain patients for lung cancer. So we're starting a different kind of a dialogue now about using blood-based biomarkers to help adjust the risk of a patient to their, their, their nodule. So it, it sounds somewhat simple, but in reality, sometimes working through all of the risk factors and unique patients' history um, you have to kind of navigate through what the best plan is uh, for that individual. Uh, so you have to kind of take a lot of things into account when you're, you're having that discussion with the patient. Great. I think we've gotten through most of the questions. I encourage anyone watching right now, if you have any more questions, now is the time to ask. Um, while we wait to see if there's any more questions in that Q&A, I want to give each of you the opportunity to take yourself off mute and you have anything you want to add before or think is important to be addressed that we haven't addressed today. You want to start with uh, Dr. Sacalarios? Um, I guess I would just say, uh, yeah, develop a good relationship with your primary doctor and, uh, you know, come forward and discuss uh, ways to quit. And most people try multiple times, studies show between five and up to 30 from what I've read uh, to quit. So just keep trying and uh, don't worry about failing. Um, and uh, also it's a team effort. So if your spouse smokes, uh, you got to get them involved or your partner because uh, it's hard to quit alone. Um, and, and that's what I'd say. That's a great point. Thank you so much. Dr. Okonobo, do you have anything else you want to add? Yes. Um I would like to add that, you know, about 30, 40 years ago, we, we couldn't provide this to anyone. Uh, now we have something that is scientifically proved to save lives. Um, it's, as I explained, something very fast, painless, and it will make a significant difference for, for the patient, for the patient's family. Um, 
And um, I really encourage um, persons that have a high risk, um, as explained by Dr. Sacolaris and Dr. Seaman, to get a CAT scan as a lung screening, because it's going to make a huge difference for you. Dr. Okonoba, I believe this is a question for you, and I, I don't know if you know, but how much is the typical copay or coinsurance for someone with insurance provided by their employer who needs screening? That's a good question. I don't know. Does anybody know? Maybe Dr. Sina might know. Yeah. So for Medicare beneficiaries, uh, it's an included covered uh, benefit, uh, and there's usually no coinsurance or co payment associated with it. Um, most Medicare replacement plans follow the same algorithm. Um, there are some private insurance plans that a copay or a deductible may apply depending on the details. Um, but it's, it's something that should be in, uh, the, the patients, um, or the, uh, individual covering, um, a coverage detail. Um, in addition, our, um, Lung cancer screening specialist here that when they schedule you, um, they will give you a prior determination of benefits and will give you your estimated out of pocket prior to um, coming in. Um, so as long as your insurance stays the same, uh, they should give you a very reliable number uh, of what that is. Um, but uh, just to reiterate, it should be a uh, covered benefit for Medicare, Medicare replacement plans and most private insurances, unless it's a, a unique plan that is a high deductible that has a lot of exclusions, but. Okay, thank you. And while you're unmuted, Dr. Seaman, is there anything else we haven't addressed today that you wanna add? Yeah, what, what I wanted to really empower uh, our, our listeners uh, in our community to do is there are so many things that we can now do for health promotion and to help curb some of the terrible diseases that ravage our, our patients. And, um, you know, lung cancer screening is one of those, as Dr. Okonomo said, 25 years ago, we really didn't have any reliable way to screen for lung cancer. Uh, and now we have a tool that can reduce the lung cancer related mortality by 20%. That's better than any chemotherapy, any surgery out there. So we really need to take advantage of this tool in our population to help as many people as we can. Uh, just to go beyond that a little bit, though, uh, this is where, and Dr. Secularius mentioned this a moment ago, this is where seek out a primary care provider, a specialist that can help you navigate through all of the cancer-related screenings that can help you reduce your risk of having a cancer-related death. And that's, that should go for you, that should go for your spouse, your loved one, your friends. Um, this is something that we need to focus on. And in addition, we didn't get too much into the, the health and well-being, but um, certainly stopping smoking should be on everybody's um, radar to, to do moving forward. But there's other things like health, uh, exercise, uh, you know, eating a good diet that, that will help reduce the risk of some cancers. Um, but uh, overall health and well-being really starts with you um, kind of taking ownership and, um, you know, doing the best you can to uh, move your, your health forward. Thank you so much, Dr. Seaman, and thank you to Dr. Okonobo and Dr. Zacalarios as well for participating. I want to thank SMH's Brian D. Jellison Cancer Institute for hosting today's event and for all of our attendees. If you're like me and you hang up the phone or get off today's call and realize, ah, I forgot to ask a question. I wish I knew more please visit smh.com slash cancer. We have a number of um, resources available. We can probably answer your question right there. We also have resources available to contact people if you have a, a, a different question that you can't seem to find information for. But again, that's smh.com slash cancer. Thank you again for participating today and have a great day. We'll go ahead and end today's call. Have a great day, everyone.